Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. So today we are finally getting to the long-awaited backstory video for Gone Air, which I was hoping to get out way sooner, but there were some parts of his story I'd been wanting to revise, which also means Teldrin's video needs a revision. It already kinda did, but I've finally gotten around to Gone Air's at least. This is a long one, I tried to keep it brief, especially in the parts we get to actually play through in our main series, which I think also made it not the most well-written thing I've ever done. But I also figured I'd throw in the speed paint footage for a piece of Gone Air I finished a while back for a little extra entertainment. Hope you guys enjoy! Gone Air's story begins on the 29th of Morningstar, 4th Era, 172. Born in the shadow of the Red Mountain, in the aftermath of the Red Year, childhood was rough for Gone Air, but he was happy nonetheless. Tales of his grandfather, the Nair of Rain, Teldrin Ebonheart, inspired a dream of adventure in the young Dunmer, but he was bound to House Redren and his family's mission to rebuild and provide for Vardenfell in its darkest time. He lived on a farmhouse with his grandmother, Drelena Androna Ebonheart, parents, Alinia Ebonheart and Zoran Drellos Ebonheart, and his companion Bullnetch Moreau, along with a few guard they used to help around the farm, outside of the small reconstruction hamlet named New Ebonheart. The town was founded by his grandmother with the help of House Redren when the eruptions began to slow, where she waited for her husband to return, claiming to know he was still alive, despite the urging of her children to give up and live somewhere safer. His family was always held in high regards with the locals, though many believed them to be a little eccentric. From an early age, Gonair was a natural with Magicka, much to the distress of his family who didn't have much knowledge on any of the schools. Therefore, they did not know how to teach him to control it, causing many magic-related accidents on the farm. At the age of 13, his grandmother received news of a newcomer to town, an Altmer mage all the way from Somerset who had arrived to do research on the island. As she did with any newcomers, which was a very rare event, to the town, she invited this mage, Adamo Kalorn, to dine with her and her family, which later led to the Altmer taking on Gonair as his apprentice. A few days out of the week, Gonair would go into town to meet with Adamo to learn from him and to aid him with his research, and spent the rest of the week at home helping at the farm learning to sword fight or following his creative pursuits in painting and writing. A couple of years passed, and Gonair's grandmother fell ill, and wasn't responding to any of Adamo's spells or potions. As her condition worsened, Gonair, in an attempt to clear his mind, took Moreau to go adventuring in the wastelands. His wandering brought him to the scathing bay, where he found Argonians were beginning to reappear. As he tried to run back to report the news to his family, he was attacked by one of the Argonians, leaving two scars on his face. At the age of 16, after Gonair's grandmother sadly passed, sightings of Argonians became closer and closer to the farmhouse, eventually leading to Gonair's mother striking the occasional scout down with the family sword, Hope's Fire. Paranoia after being attacked by the assumed cultists led Gonair to begin taking Hope's Fire with him any time he traveled to town to learn from Adamo. But in a vengeful move against Gonair's family, while he was in town with Adamo, the Argonians raided the farm, striking down Gonair's parents and beloved Netch. Hours later, Gonair, escorted by Adamo, arrived at the scene, Argonians still looting the home. Gonair was wounded in the following fight and fled into the ash, leaving Adamo behind. Adamo, after killing the lingering cultists, eventually found Gonair unconscious and brought him back to his home in New Ebonheart, where Gonair stayed for the following years. But the Argonian threat was not gone. The town of New Ebonheart sent a request for aid to House Redoran multiple times, occasionally maybe getting one new guard in return. Their neglected pleas led to disaster, as when Gonair was 25 years old, the cultists had grown in number and eventually attacked the hamlet. In the chaos that followed, Gonair was separated from Adamo and fled in the direction of the Balmora reconstruction. Three days after the attack, news arrived to Balmora that New Ebonheart had been completely destroyed. Gonair had no idea what fate had befallen Adamo, so after a short time of resorting to thievery to survive, Gonair was hired by a Nordic family of traveling merchants to be a caretaker for their Patguar herd. He traveled through the wastes of Vardenfell with the Nords, to various settlements attempting to survive the constant ash storms and raider attacks. He grew close with the Nords, and even formed a relationship with the son Bjorn. The Nords eventually began to plan a journey back to their homeland of Skyrim, and offered to get Gonair set up in the College of Winterhold after they arrived so that he could study Magicka there. Shortly before they were to depart, Bjorn presented an amulet of Mara to Gonair, in a proposal for marriage, but Gonair declined, believing himself too young to be married, and afraid to upset his ancestors with being betrothed to a Nordic man, not quite seeing the betrayal felt by Bjorn afterwards. Mere days later, as Gonair was off refilling his canteen in a river, a violent ash storm devastated the land. Gonair hid in a partially collapsed ancestral tomb during the storm, but when it calmed, 
despite all his searching, he could not find the Nords. He was sick of Vardenfell, sick of losing his family time and time again, sick of struggling every day to live in the nightmarish conditions of his homeland. He decided to leave. He left for Skyrim, with slight hope to find the Nords there, but even if he didn't, he didn't care. He needed out. After visiting the family tomb one last time, he took a boat to the mainland and left to Skyrim. Gonair made his way through the mountains, careful to avoid any patrols, as most of his stuff had been left with the Nords, and he could not afford the toll to travel between provinces if there was one. Upon arrival in the rift, he was in awe. He had never seen so much color in his life. After wandering for a while, he decided he needed to find water to wash off all the ash. He found a river not too far off, and after being horrified by how cold the water was, wandered off once more, admiring all the flora around him. As he was distracted, the war cry of a man behind him startled him, causing Gonair to erupt and electrocute the man. As the man fell, another bashed Gonair in the back of the head, causing him to black out. He awoke on a wagon, still dazed from his injury. In the wagon were three Nords, all tied up and one gagged. As he was still trying to come to his senses, one of the Nords began speaking with him and the ungagged man. Gonair was horrified to learn that he had stumbled into some civil war battle that had been taken prisoner and was to be executed at Helgen along with the Stormcloak rebels. But as he awaited his fate, a winged form blackened the sky, causing chaos and allowing Gonair to escape with one of the rebels, Rayloth. After resting in a nearby town, Gonair decided to depart and seek out this college the Nords had told him about. But first, Rayloth asked that he stop by the town of Whiterun on his way to report what had happened at Helgen. He ended up helping the Jarl and his court wizard for a short time, until reports arrived that a dragon had attacked a nearby watchtower. The Jarl asked for Gonair's help in the matter, and though Gonair was petrified at the thought, his pride wouldn't allow him to turn down the challenge in front of the Jarl. The dragon at the Watchtower was not the same monster that attacked Helgen, and by some miracle, at least in Gonair's eyes, he and some of the town guard were successful in taking the dragon down. As Gonair landed the final blow, the dragon's very soul began to seep out of the dragon's wounds, flowing straight into Gonair, awakening some kind of force in him. Gonair's thume erupted staggering all the guards that survived, and absolutely stunning Gonair. As he ran off to report their success to the Jarl, the sky boomed with a chorus of men, shaking the very earth. The Jarl and his court tried to explain to Gonair that he must be dragonborn, and that the shout from the mountains had to have been the Greybeards, summoning him up to High Hrothgar. Gonair scoffed at the idea. Surely he only absorbed its power because he landed the final blow. This was all madness, and he took his leave to the college. On his way there, he came across a broken down cart, a strange man dressed in Jester's clothes accompanying it. The Jester ranted about his cart breaking down while he was moving the corpse of his mother, and the farmer that lived by would not help him. Amused by him, Gonair spent the evening helping him fix his wagon wheel, and then was on his way again. He was accepted into the college, and spent a good amount of time studying there, making some acquaintances and useful contacts there. But things are not peaceful. An Altmer mage, dressed in robes similar to Gonair's former master, began stirring up trouble, but was stopped by Gonair. Adamo had only briefly mentioned the Thalmor a couple of times before. Gonair believed they were just a group of researchers, not realizing their true nature until his time in Skyrim. Afterwards, he aided one of the higher-ranking mages in their research on the Dwemer, in the process acquiring one of the artifacts owned by his grandfather in the Third Era, one of Kagranak's tools, Keening, that was lost to his family in the Red Year. The mage hoped to discover what happened to the Dwemer when they disappeared, but his research only ended with him disappearing as well. This set Gonair off. Too many absurd things had been happening to him ever since arriving in Skyrim. He had next to no money, was damned tired of the snow, and coming across Keening was sparked curiosity of the fate of his grandfather. He decided to head south and look for work, maybe get enough money to buy a house, and on the way stop by the Shrine of Azura to commune with her and seek peace. During the communion, as he was already known by the prince, he was sent on a quest to retrieve and purify her artifact, Azura Star. Afterwards, she named him her champion, but once asked about the Nerverine, the only response was a cold and monotone, his legacy continues. This slightly frustrated Gonair, as it was a tad unclear if she meant he was still alive, like his grandmother believed, or if his legacy continued through Gonair. Either way, he didn't want to press the Daedric Prince further, so he departed and left towards Riften. There, he was briefly hired as a stable hand, until he met someone with a better offer. A member of the Thieves' Guild, Brynjolf, extended an invitation to Gonair after he helped him with a local merchant. 
The Thieves' Guild had definitely seen better days, and no less, during his time amongst them, he was betrayed by the leader, Mercer, almost dying in the process. But he was saved by a former member of the Thieves' Guild, who then offered for him and Brynjolf to become Nightingales, like her. She claimed this was the only way to stop Mercer and take the skeleton key he had stolen back to Nocturnal, so that her favor would return to the guild. But she failed to mention that doing so would cause Gonair's afterlife to be spent guarding the Twilight Sepulcher, until right before the ceremony. Gonair called the whole thing off, still taking the Nightingale armor she had given him before the ceremony, and killed Mercer on his own, keeping the skeleton key for himself. He quickly and quietly returned that night to gather his things from the chest in the guild. But on his way out, heard a commotion coming from the town's orphanage. Shrill, old woman's voice was berating the children there, grinding on Gonair. Something in him snapped. He strolled right into the orphanage and slit the old woman's throat, her corpse falling to the ground as Gonair walked away. Children utterly shocked, but celebrating. He slipped out of town without anyone saying a thing. Gonair headed west, towards Falkreath. He had saved up a good amount of gold during his time with the guild, so he decided to settle in Falkreath and build a home out in the woods. Months went by working on the house, and as it neared completion, Gonair started to hear things in the woods. Then, glimpses of shadows in the trees, watching him. One night, as he sat by the fire, a courier arrived with a note, simply with a black hand, and the words, We know, written in dark ink. Not long after, he awoke in a much colder place his head throbbing. As he came to, he saw a woman completely shrouded in light armor sitting calmly with him, and three people bound on the floor. She explained that the old woman he had killed was a target of the Dark Brotherhood, and since he had stolen the contract, he was to make up for it by killing one of the bound, as one of them had a contract on them, and he had to figure out who. Gonair simply killed all three, which delighted the woman, who introduced herself as Astrid, and welcomed him into the Dark Brotherhood. He quickly felt at home with the Brotherhood, but trouble arrived along with a familiar face. After returning from a contract, Gonair found the jester he had aided a long while back, Cicero, speaking with the other members of the Brotherhood. He had arrived with the sarcophagus of the Night Mother, and seemed upset with the other Dark Brothers and Sisters. After everyone calmed down, Gonair greeted Cicero, who was happy to see the myrrh that had helped him again. But much to Cicero's distress, Gonair had no idea who the Night Mother was, so they spent the evening talking about the old ways of the Brotherhood. Time went on, and one morning as Gonair returned from another contract, Astrid asked that he spy on Cicero by hiding in the Night Mother's coffin, as she believed to have overheard him plotting against her with another member of the Brotherhood. Gonair was repulsed by the idea, but obeyed, only to learn Cicero had just been speaking with the Night Mother, and even more to his surprise and disgust, the Night Mother didn't respond to Cicero but to Gonair instead, telling him to seek out a man named Motier. Not long after, he was discovered by Cicero, who was enraged by this betrayal and desecration, until Gonair explained that she had indeed spoken to him. His anger turned to absolute glee and madness, as he started singing and dancing about Gonair being the listener. Astrid came running into the room after hearing all the shouting, as the two tried to explain what had happened. Astrid forbade Gonair to look into the Night Mother's request, until some time afterwards. When she finally allowed him to go, Gonair returned back to Astrid with Motier's plan to kill the Emperor. This took months to carry out, but Gonair was successful. However, Astrid had betrayed Gonair and Cicero, which backfired on herself, getting her and most of the family killed. Afterwards, the remaining members of the Brotherhood moved to a sanctuary in Dawnstar, and Gonair worked with the Night Mother to begin restoring the old ways of the Dark Brotherhood. Gonair spent a long time living with the Dark Brotherhood, recruiting many new members of the family, and forming an odd relationship with Cicero. He was happy within the Brotherhood, but guilt started consuming him. He had constant nightmares of his ancestors, his grandmother in particular, and they were disappointed in the dark path in life Gonair had taken. Disappointed that he was ignoring his fate. Disappointed he was ignoring that he was Dragonborn. Originally, he had believed he only absorbed their power because he always got the last hit, but he knew that was not the case. He and Cicero finally decided to go seek out the Greybeards. He learned under the Greybeards for a short time, before being contacted by one of the last surviving members of the group of dragon hunters known as the Blades, Delphine. Delphine's first theory on why the dragons were returning was by the hands of the Thalmor. Gonera infiltrated their embassy in Skyrim and learned this was not the case, but was able to learn of another Blades member who still lived, Esbern. 
Esbern was an eccentric, but wise old man, who knew that there was more to this dragon threat than anyone knew. Alduin, the world leader, had returned. It was the same dragon Gonair encountered in Helgen. If he was not stopped, the world would certainly end. Together, the four of them located Skyhaven Temple, an old blade's fortress, where they learned that the Nords of old defeated Alduin with a shout, and then were able to vanquish him, but accidentally send him forward in time in the process. Gonair set off to find and learn the shout, meeting the leader of the Greybeards, a dragon named Parthenax, in the process. Parthenax explained that the Nords had made this shout, and dragons were unable to learn it, but knew that if he brought an Elder Scroll to the Third of the World, he'd be able to warp the time wound there where Alduin had been banished and look back into time to learn the shout. Gonair returned to the college, where he learned of a man that would be the most likely to know where an Elder Scroll was. This man, Septimus, was researching far to the north, and upon meeting him, was definitely out of his mind. But Gonair aided him, and in turn, located an Elder Scroll. But this was not the only thing to come of it. Something had been watching Gonair for a long time. Hermaeus Mora. The Daedric Prince manifested before Gonair, telling him Septimus had outlived his usefulness, and offered Gonair a spot as his new champion. Gonair nervously agreed, fearful to insult a Daedric Prince. Afterwards, Gonair returned to the Third of the World, and learned the shout used to take down Alduin, who arrived to battle with Gonair not long after. The Dragonborn was successful, but Alduin managed to escape, causing Gonair to make both sides of the Civil War call a temporary ceasefire until the threat was dealt with, so that the Jarl of Whiterun would allow him to capture a dragon in his palace to learn where Alduin ran off to. The plan went without fail, and the captured dragon, Odaving, told Gonair Alduin had gone to a ruin called Skuldafen, and through a portal to the Nordic afterlife Sovngarde, so that he could regain his strength, and agreed to help Gonair get there in return for his freedom. So our hero traveled to Sovngarde, and with the help of the honored dead there, defeated the world leader. Gonair took some time to himself afterwards, spending a lot of time with Cicero at his house in the woods. He began researching and chanting, and began work on a ring that would allow him to cast destruction spells endlessly, without effort. But after his acceptance of being dragonborn, and defeating both the world leader and the emperor himself, he was starting to change. Those with dragon blood were born to rule. Why should he not? After learning of a rare resource known as Ethereum, he traveled all across Skyrim to acquire enough of it to forge himself a crown fit for an emperor, if not a god. Not long after, Gonair was attacked in the streets of Falkreath by strange cultists claiming Gonair was a false dragonborn, shouting about some Lord Mirak. After disposing of the cultists, he found a note on one of them, ordering the cultists to kill him before he reached Solstheim. So naturally, that's where our dragonborn traveled next. Upon arriving in the ashy town of Ravenrock, Gonair found that inhabitants of the island were being seemingly controlled to work on some odd structures. Investigating further brought him to Mirak's temple, where he found a book that pulled him into Hermaeus Mora's realm of almost infinite knowledge, Apocrypha. In front of him was no other than Mirak himself, who insulted Gonair and promptly sent him back to Nern. With the help of some other locals of Solstheim, including the Telwani wizard Neloth, who later makes Gonair a part of the house, and by finding more of Hermaeus Mora's black books and studying in the realm, Gonair learned a shout to bend the will of others, even dragons themselves, freeing those controlled by Mirak to build these obelisks. Eventually, with the help of Hermaeus Mora, Gonair manages to defeat Mirak. After his victory, our dragonborn spends a long time in Solstheim, eventually acquiring a house there, and, of course, throughout his time there, he frequently went to Apocrypha to seek out and study forbidden magic. But with the Red Mountain looming in the distance, and living in a town that his grandfather helped found, the one question that has shaped and haunted his very life returned to mind. What was the fate of the Nerevreen? If he were able to find the answer anywhere, it would be Apocrypha. And he was correct. After a long period of searching and begging for Hermaeus Mora's aid, he finally found an old journal belonging to his grandfather, Teldrin. The journal was from the second century of the Fourth Era, and documented Teldrin's travels across the western regions of Tamriel, and frequently referenced an island to the south of Ballinwood that he seemed to use as his home base. Immediately, Gonair hired a crew to take him and Cicero there. Frequent storms plagued the voyage. Gonair manipulated them as best as he could, adding some speed to the trip, but eventually causing them to crash into land one night as they neared their destination. Believing it could possibly be the right island, Gonair, Cicero, and a few of the members of the crew began to search the island. It wasn't long before they found signs of at least one inhabitant. Eventually, they came across a yurt, 
Light smoke flowing out of it. Garnier called out, and at first there was silence. He took one step closer, right as a flurry of blue cloth and fire came roaring out, taking one of the crewmen in a headlock, a fiery sword at his chest. Garnier froze at the sight of true flame, speechless, only able to unsheathe and present hope's fire to the tall, pale Dunmer before him. A moment of confusion followed, as Garnier tried to explain to Teldrin they were not sent after him to kill him for his deeds as the Nerevarine, rather that he was his grandson, much to the disbelief of Teldrin. Garnier sent everyone back to the ship so that he could speak alone with his grandfather, eventually convincing him to go back to Solstheim with him. Garnier and Teldrin frequently argued, but generally Teldrin accompanied Garnier and Cicero on their travels, eventually heading back with them to Skyrim. But of course, not without the new baby bullnetch Garnier had saved from hunters, and fondly named Squat. When they returned to Falkreath, Garnier noticed someone was living in the abandoned house across from his. This new neighbor later introduced himself as Reno Chadson, who was accompanied by the small skeleton, Dan. Garnier was puzzled and cautious of the necromancer, but they later proved to be trustworthy allies. For months, the Ebonhearts spent their time somewhat peacefully around Lakeview Manor, with Garnier still frequently traveling to Apocrypha, spending most of his time there continuing to learn forbidden magic. But late one night, as Garnier was extinguishing the last of the candles, there was a loud knock on the door. Much to Garnier's surprise, on the other side, there stood Adamo, travel-weary and with a desperate look in his eyes. The Thalmor were trying to track down the Nerevarine, who they believe had allegedly arrived in the north, no doubtedly catching wind of the rumor by the excited citizens of Ravenrock. Knowing of Garnier's relation to the Nerevarine, Adamo offered to take up the task of hunting him down, and was easily able to learn that Garnier was in Skyrim after his exploits with the Blades. The Thalmor, of course, were hunting him too, not that Garnier considered them much of a threat. Adamo offered to help cover them from the Thalmor, and said that he was stationed at the embassy near Solitude, but had purchased a home in the city so they couldn't keep such a close watch on him. Garnier, eager to see the Altmer again, agreed to his help, and offered him to stay at the manor as much as he pleased. Months quietly passed, but things were not well. Vampire sightings and attacks became the common talk of Falkreath. As Garnier was in town picking up groceries, he was stopped by a familiar Nordic woman, the sister of Bjorn, Frigga. Ecstatic to see each other again, they went to the tavern to catch up. Frigga told Garnier of their fate during the ash storm that separated them. They had tried to seek out Garnier, but merely a day later, they were caught and imprisoned by the Thalmor. She revealed that her father was a spy during the Great War, and was on the run from the Thalmor ever since. Her father was killed by the Thalmor, but her and her brother were able to escape. But sadly, Bjorn had recently been killed by the growing vampire menace. Garnier was enraged, and had heard rumors of the Dawnguard, a group dedicated to killing vampires. So he went and gathered his allies to join them, and successfully took down Lord Harkon, and thwart his plans to block out the sun. Which might be a somewhat sudden way to end this video. There is more to Garnier's story, I promise but I kind of have to wait until Elder Scrolls 6 is out before I can set anything into stone, which absolutely sucks, but I do have a lot of fun stuff planned. I just know it's probably going to change whatever I have planned a lot, so I'm gonna keep it a secret for now. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Sorry I couldn't get into details too much in some parts. I didn't want this to be a three hour long video, which it could have easily turned into. I will be doing an updated one for Teldrin, and eventually videos for my other characters as well, so look forward to that. Also wanted to mention real quick that I have posted Garnera's backstory to the Elder Scrolls Amino, and will likely be posting like a lot there about my elves, so if you're interested I would definitely join that. I've also been talking with people like a lot on there, so you know, if you want to come hang out, it's a pretty good place to do it. But yeah, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like, maybe consider supporting my coffee or Patreon if you want to support me and my channel, it would mean the world to me, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye bye!